Hey, leaders and learners, Lenard Geddes here with the Learn Well Projects. Just wanted to come at you with a little bit from the lab um, as I've been talking with other folks and thinking through some of the mental experiences that I've been having um, when writing this book and just other work projects. You know, one of the things that I have thought I've always done pretty well is manage negative emotions. You know, negative emotions are constantly a part of our lives. They're constantly attacking us, trying to get us off of our game. And so um, I was recently talking with a friend who was saying that she has a friend of hers who, when uh, dealing with negative emotions, he will start playing depressed music and start sort of dwelling in the negativity of the emotion, not intentionally, but just like he's feeling bad. And then as a result, he's feeling like some melancholy. So he wants some melancholy music. And next thing you know, he's listening to some negative music. And then he finds himself in this vortex of negativity. And I just thought, you know, that's everybody deals, everybody has negative thoughts, but how we deal with them is really the strength of our character. And and that's really determines whether those thoughts are going to hold us down or just be something that we recognize and then move forward. And so I want to share a few thoughts with the hopes that it may help you. So one of the things that I realize is that I've had these inherent strategies that I use to deal with negative thoughts that I, I don't think may be public enough for others. And so one is um, whenever I get a negative thought or you know, a bombardment of negative thoughts. Sometimes I will isolate the thought. I'll just say, you know, this is this negative thing that's coming up and it's making me feel this way. And so by isolating the thought, um, it allows me to take its power away from the multitude of thoughts coming at me at one time. So that's, that's one step is isolate the thought. The second one is, and I kind of already hit on it, is you want to link the thought with the emotion. Because the way negative negativity happens is it just kind of starts off as a emotion. We just feel a certain way. But in my counseling background, one of the things we realized is that there's a lot of self-talk that's going on below the radar. It's this sort of subterranean activity that's actually driving our feelings. And many people don't know about it. So for example, in a counseling session, it's very common for someone to start crying. <laughs> and you see the kind of quintessential movie depictions of a counseling session when someone's crying all of a sudden. Well, there's a lot of truth to that because what effective therapy does is it will reveal often for the first time some negative pattern of thought or some uh, uh, thinking uh, that has a hold on you. And for the first time, the person gains insight into that and it often will evoke tears. They'll start to cry from it. And so in my own personal life, what I do is, is I just recognize if there's a mood, there's a thinking pattern along with it. Or let me rephrase it and be a little more precise. If there's an emotion, there is a thinking behind that emotion that is animating that emotion. And I want to find the thinking pattern because that's the key to getting to the emotion. Now, emotions are about feelings. And so if you attempt this path, you're not going to feel like doing it. It's going to feel like you're manipulating yourself when you're new at this, but it's actually a healthy strategy to use. And then the last one I want to focus on is a mood. So a mood is different from an emotion. A mood is this persistent sort of layer that just kind of hovers on top of you. It's like a heaviness. And that could be a happy mood. So I don't want to make it all negative. That can be a happy mood. There can be a negative mood. There can be a, an isolated and agitated mood, whatever it may be. But, but again, if there's a mood, you can bet that there are a pattern of emotions that underlay that mood. And then underneath those emotions are those thoughts. So for an example, I'm writing this book and I recognize that as I'm typing, I'm all of a sudden am spending so much time typing on this one paragraph. And I noticed this happening repeatedly that I'm just spending way too much time on these paragraphs, churning out uh, these pages for this book. And, and for those who are just joining, I'm publishing a book with Stylus Publishing and it's a higher education book. And the title of it tentatively is Transition Traps and Gaps. And it's, hope, it's helping students overcome some of these transitional challenges 
that are really hindering students from success. So with that aside, going back to what I was saying in writing this book, I realized that part of why it's taking me so long is because I have some self-doubt. I'm writing these paragraphs and I'm just battling, doubting myself. I write, a, write out a few sentences and then I start doubting. Is that good? Is that good enough? Is that that? And, um, and so it was really weighing me down. It was slowing me down. And so I had to deal with that. And I just went straight to the thought process. No, hey, you were contracted for this book for a reason. You've been speaking on this for quite some time. And those are the things that really helped me out. So again, um, recognize the thinking, very important. Isolate the multitude of thoughts by finding the one thought or the one, <clears throat> the preeminent thinking that's really uh, affecting you. And then the third one is you want to recognize a mood. And in that mood, you want to then um, recognize that if there's a mood there, a persistent, just constant feeling, uh, then there are some emotions underneath that mood. And then there are some thinking underneath those emotions. And that's the hard work that we have to do sometimes. And I'll end with this one extra thought. <clears throat> if you're a if you're an introspective person, like I tend to think that I am, where I'm constantly analyzing my intentions and emotions, that's a healthy thing to do. It's something that more people need to do. However, it can be self-destructive. If you are so introspective that you're constantly looking at the flaws in yourself, then there's a problem there. Um, you should be, you should have a healthy balance of seeing some of the areas of growth, as I like to call them, and seeing them as, um, and seeing the areas of strengths. So I think and right on the spot here, I just revealed another bonus um, tactic that I use. And so that tactic is when I see a weakness, instead of me looking at it as a weakness, which is a sort of stain against my character, maybe I look at it as an as a growth opportunity. It's a fine, it's a jewel, it's an opportunity for me to grow. So I think if you add that to your to your bag of skills, I think you'll find yourself growing, building and not tearing yourself down. So I hope this helps you out. It's helping me out. I'll be back next time. Next time, I'm going to talk about a few other things on this same topic, but I'm going to switch it to talking about some strategies that you can use um, to help you sort of stay in this, what I call the perfect place of constraint that's going to help you stay focused on a straight and narrow path to success. All right. Thanks.